Over the past 22 years, we as fans have sat in awe at the sustained success of the Melbourne Storm. It's a club based thousands of kilometres away from rugby league heartland with the other footy code. Let's completely examine the glory, the fall from grace and the resilient fight back story which is the Melbourne Storm. Starting back in the year 1998, John Rebo would be the founder of the first professional Victorian rugby league club, the Melbourne Storm. A brand new club that was initially supposed to be implemented into the breakaway rugby league competition, the Super League, found itself in the new NRL competition after both the ARL and the Super League resolved their differences. The club was backed by media giant News Limited, who also owns the NRL. Many fans were outraged by the Storm's inclusion into the Australian Rugby League as foundation clubs like the North Sydney Bears, Western Suburbs Magpies and Balmain Tigers were in dire need of financial support whilst the NRL was entirely focused on expanding. During the turn of the century, we saw many of these clubs forced to merge or fold. Melbourne benefited from the folding of both the Adelaide Rams and the Hunter Mariners as they scooped up star free agents like Scott Hill and Brett Kamali. The Storm's first season in the NRL was incredibly successful, as they started their season with four consecutive wins and ended up with seven wins from their first eight games. The Storm was led by Premiership winning head coach Chris Anderson, finishing the regular season in third, only falling one game short from the grand finale. Anderson would also go on to win Dally M Coach of the Year in 1998, with pundits surprised with the expansion club's sudden success. The 1999 season would prove the Storm's 1998 season was no fluke, and that they were an established contender in the NRL. Finishing yet again in third spot, the Storm would win 16 games and have four players featuring the New South Wales State of Origin side. Their season started shakily, with a record of four wins and three losses by round seven. We saw the Storm flourish though in mid-year, as they won eight of their next nine games. Their out-and-out -out star throughout the season was their halfback, Brett Kamali, who took home the club's Player of the Year honours and was key in the finals run. This finals run was not conventional and saw the Storm lose their first round bout against the brand new merger club, the St George Illawarra Dragons, 34-10. In the following weeks, the Storm would bounce back beating both the Eels and the Bulldogs in elimination finals to book their spot in the grand final. In front of the biggest crowd in NRL history of 107,999 people, Stadium Australia would be host to one of the greatest grand final endings. Down 14-0 at halftime, the Storm seemed to have crumbled under the enormous pressure, and again were looking like they would lose to the Dragons for the fourth time in one season. In a game in which Melbourne mostly spent surviving a Dragons offensive onslaught, they would find themselves only down four points late in the second half. In it, the referees would deem Ansco's tackle illegal and award a penalty try. Mark Guy would convert in front of the post and would give the Melbourne Storm their maiden premiership in just their second season. Taking a brief look at their following three seasons, the Storm would see a drop off in their performances with a first round finals loss in 2000. Contributed heavily to the retirement of Captain Glenn Lazarus and the departure of Vice Captain Tawera Nikau. 2001 and 2002 were Melbourne's first two seasons missing out on finals footy, placing 9th and 10th in a dramatic fall for a club that was only Premier's three seasons prior. Chris Anderson would resign midway through the 2001 season with his replacement Mark Murray fired at the end of 2002. It was clear that the boss John Ribbo had become tiresome of Melbourne's poor performances as he would make a coaching acquisition that would change his club's trajectory for years to come. Two thousand and three would welcome a new chapter for the Melbourne Storm as the Craig Bellamy era would begin. Under the tutelage of Super Coach Wayne Bennett at the Brisbane Broncos, Bellamy became a highly touted coach linked to various clubs. It was rumoured he was close to coaching the West Tigers before he was snapped up by the Melbourne Storm. Bellamy's impact was immediate as we saw Melbourne's return to their winning ways, making the finals for three consecutive seasons and then break out into a powerhouse in two thousand and six. During this period. Four of the NRL's biggest stars would emerge. Making his debut in 2002, but solidifying his starting role in 2003, was Cameron Smith. In 2003, we also saw future star Billy Slater, featuring at halfback and centre with 19 tries in his debut season. In 2005, Greg Inglis would feature in first grade, and in 2006, Cooper Cronk would replace Matt Orford as a starting halfback. 
The 2003, 4 and 5 seasons were positive for Melbourne, as they did return to finals footy. They were still nowhere near that dominant storm play of the late 90s, with all three seasons ending in first round eliminations with the storm not providing much of a fight. It was only until about 2006 when we saw the big four of Cronk, Smith, Slater and Inglis thrive as the Storm finished minor premiers eight points ahead of the second place Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs. They recorded just four losses during the entirety of their season whilst only losing one game at home. Inglis, Smith and Dallas Johnson made representative appearances for the Maroons whilst new halfback Cooper Cronk would win Dally M Halfback of the Year in 2006. The Storm would live up to expectations as they coasted through to the 2006 Grand Final, beating the Eels and Dragons on the way. Their opponent would be the Brisbane Broncos, in the first NRL Grand Final to not include a team from New South Wales. The game was a tight affair, but would conclude with a game-clinching field goal by the great Darren Lockyer. A disappointing end to a dominant season for the Storm, as they just fell short. The next three years would give us the most successful NRL side, rivaled by only the 2018 and 2019 Sydney Roosters. Let's look at 2007, where Melbourne were excellent, winning a whopping 21 games. The success was built off their stout defence, which had only conceded 11.5 points per game, the least amount of points conceded in the club's history. Smith's stellar season was rewarded, as he won the Golden Boot and the International Player of the Year award. Israel Folau broke onto the scene in 2007 as well, winning the NRL Rookie of the Year award scoring 21 tries. The Storm finished 6 points ahead of the second place Sea Eagles and made quick work of their finals opponents. A 40-0 victory over the Broncos would help the Storm get revenge from the season prior, and a 26-10 win over the Eels in the preliminary final would book a first versus second battle with the Sea Eagles. Melbourne would dominate their main rival the Sea Eagles, grabbing the lead early and pushing on throughout the game. 34-8 would be the final score with the Storm winning their second premiership, redeeming themselves for their shortcomings the season prior. 2008 would be much of the same with Melbourne claiming the top spot in the final round, leading on higher point differential. Like last season, the Manly Seagulls would be their closest rival and would finish in second spot. Billy Slater had his career best year winning the Golden Boot, International Player of the Year and Fullback of the Year, becoming the out-and-out -out best fullback in rugby league. The accolades didn't stop there though. Inglis, Smith and Folau were all award winners, showing the amount of talent this one team had. What's happened to Ivan Cleary? Is he still breathing? No, 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 no. Anyways, Melbourne faced the dawning task now of playing away at a packed Suncorp Stadium as they took on the Broncos. The semi-final was filled with drama, an absolute historic finals game. It had all star representatives allowed for offside. Another key this kept them in the game, and with a minute remaining, Melbourne produced the incredible. A game-winning try by Inglis progressed the Storm to a preliminary final, 28-0 away from home. This meant the Seagulls yet again would play the Storm for the Premiership. Melbourne would be without Cameron Smith, who was suspended for a dangerous tackle, with the Manly Seagulls being the fresher of the two sides, as the Melbourne Storm had to win two games away from home, fourth on the ladder, by season's end. Their slip on the table was contributed to their 4 and 3, who they dispatched easily with 28 and 30 point wins. Jared Hayne. Hayne was undoubtedly the best player in football at the time, with a 7 game string of Man of the Match honours. The Eels brought a significantly different prospect to the Storm, which made for an intriguing battle. Starting off strong, the Storm took charge of the game, scoring 2 tries and leading 10 0 at half time. Lee Slater would be named Clive Churchill medalist as the Storm became the greatest club of the NRL era. So 2010, this is where it gets scandalous. Things appeared to be going smoothly five rounds into the season as the Storm started 4-2 in fourth spot yet again, ready to repeat their championship heroics from the season prior. The big four were all healthy and playing up to expectations. Bellamy was still at the helm and all was well until everything changed. On the 22nd of April 2010, the unthinkable was announced. The penalty will be the stripping of three minor premierships and two premierships. The return of $1.1 million in prize money 
that will be distributed to the other 15 clubs evenly. A fine of $500,000. In the 2010 season, all competition points earned thus far will be taken away and the team shall not accrue any further points in the 2010 season. In news that would rock Australian sport, the Melbourne Storm would be exposed for significantly breaching the NRL salary cap as it was found for the past five years from 2006 to 2010, a total of $3.78 million of undisclosed payments to players outside the salary cap had been made. An elaborate dual contract and bookkeeping system meant that the NRL was kept unaware of these blatant indiscretions. This investigation had been taking place over the past six months and had found damning information on Melbourne Storm board members like CEO Brian Waldron and Chief Executive Matt Hansen. Files were found in the home of Hansen that showed that an unnamed Melbourne Storm player had been given a letter of offer of $950,000 whilst his actual contract lodged to the NRL was only valued at $400,000. Incentives such as boats, cars, house renovations and gift vouchers accounted to a total of $700,000 in bonuses for stars like Inglis, Slater and Smith. Although confusing, it was understood after thorough investigation, these players were unaware that these extra payments had been made outside the cap and were not suspended. They did receive an overall punishment though, as all minor and Telstra premierships were stripped from 2006 to 2009, as the Storm's glorious five-year run vanished in an instant. They were forced to recompensate the other clubs equally from their $1.1 million made in prize money and were subjected to last place for the entirety of the 2010 season. It was clear the Melbourne Storm had cheated, and even if the players and coaches didn't know it, they benefited by being able to recruit and most importantly retain players. What hurts here is the actions of the Storm not only hurt their own reputation, but create an unfair playing field that stopped other clubs from having a chance at the Premiership. Look at the 2009 Eels for example, a fairy tale side that just came short of a title. These irresponsible decisions change legacies and ruin reputations for not just the Storm, but for every club. It marked a dark day for not only the NRL, but the entirety of Australian sports. Okay, so that's part one of this Melbourne Storm mini documentary. In part two, I plan to talk about how the Storm has rebuilt its reputation over the past decade. So subscribe, like, and turn post notifications on so you're notified when that releases. Also, I just wanted to announce that I've started a Patreon to help support this channel. These videos often take two to three days of work, which at the time of this video, I do not make money off. Any contribution would help with there being three price ranges to show your support, all having unique benefits. So click in the description if you are interested. Yep, so that's all for this mini documentary. Expect part two to come out within the next few weeks. Thank you so much for watching.